Hey everyone, welcome to the AI Canvas, the podcast that explores the impact of generative AI on businesses, the arts, and our everyday lives. I'm your host, David Foster, co-founder of Applied Data Science Partners and author of the book, Generative Deep Learning, Teaching Machines to Paint, Write, Compose, and Play. Now, over the coming weeks, we'll be diving deep into fascinating conversations with a diverse range of thought leaders, including musicians, artists, journalists, educators, marketers, lawyers, and those at the cutting edge of this fascinating field. We'll explore their unique insights into the opportunities and potential threats of deploying this technology across industries and how it's going to reshape our world. We have a fascinating conversation ahead of us, so sit back, relax, and let's dive into the world of generative AI right here on the AI Canvas. Well, hello everyone, and welcome back to the AI Canvas podcast. Uh, my name is David Foster, I'll be your host. And today we are joined by an absolutely fantastic guest, uh, Luba Elliott. Uh, Luba is curator and researcher specializing in AI art. Uh, she founded the Neurops Creativity and Design Workshop, and she's an honorary senior research fellow at the UCL Center for Artificial Intelligence. Her projects include the exhibition Reflections in the Water and the Art AI Festival in Leicester, UK. Her work focuses on engaging the public around recent developments in creative AI through talks and giving exhibitions across the art, business and technology spectrum. So Luba, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on the podcast. I, I can't imagine a, a better guest for our first inaugural episode. Thank you so much, David, for the invitation. And yeah, excited to chat to you today. Great. So let's start just with your personal journey into this space, because I think one of the most interesting things is how people fall into AI art and generative AI, because it's not a field, I guess, that many people would have heard about when you started in the field. And I, I'm just curious to know how you found yourself uh, getting to the point where you are considered an AI art expert, especially as you know, your background, I believe, is in modern languages. Um, so perhaps you could just tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so I suppose I studied um, modern languages at Cambridge at the same time as you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, and yeah, I think I've always been sort of interested in art and uh, new technologies and so on. And uh, as, as one of my languages was German, after graduation, I went to Germany and began working in startups because I thought it was like a really good experience to kind of learn about business, learn about the local culture, improve my German and so on. And one of those startups was, um, was a database of art collectors called Larry's List. And it was kind of really interesting to gather this information on art collectors and to try and bring sort of a new project or a new solution into the art industry. And that sort of got me interested in art. And then when I moved back to the UK, I was organizing various hackathons like Startup Weekend Art, where you try and come up with an art business in, uh, I don't know, it was like 48 hours or so on. Mm. And it was around the time when uh, Deep Dream came along. So I think that was like 2015. And uh, it kind of it started appearing in the mainstream press. And Deep Dream is uh, basically a technique that kind of looks at, a, at an image. It gets excited by certain features. And out of a normal image, you get this kind of image that's like very multicolored. And it's got all these like dogs and slugs coming out of it. So it was kind of quite creative and it had a quite distinct aesthetic. And I became quite interested in what was happening in um, kind of in AI research. And I realized that I have a lot of kind of friends and contacts in the field. So I sort of began organizing uh, a meetup in London and that led to other opportunities to curate events and exhibitions and kind of speak at a variety of events. Yeah, that, that's fascinating. I, I remember actually going to one of your events in London. I think it was uh, featuring the artist Scott Eaton and his early work on things like Picks to Picks and you know, Cycle Gan when that was all kicking off. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's an amazingly um, sort of to, the, to your ability to forecast into the future and see this as something that's actually going to really take off is, is really uh, inspiring, I think. Um, was there a particular moment where you remember thinking, 
yeah, this is something that I think is going to change the world. And that's something that, you know, in years to come, this isn't just going to be a sort of niche area of uh, some people's interest, but actually is something that's being talked about as the hottest topic in technology at the moment. Oh, I don't know if I ever kind of thought so much about whether AI, AI art will change the world. I think I was uh, sort of mostly attracted by the community of artists and researchers working in the field because everybody was like so passionate and, they were, and so kind of excited about the tools. And at that time in like, I don't know, 2016 or 17, there wasn't really much financial reward. So it's not as if you could mint your creation as an NFT and sell it for a lot of money. It's like everybody was doing it for mainly for passion. And uh, mm. I think some of the early kind of GAN tools were quite uh, yeah, maybe rudimentary. The generated images weren't kind of that great. But I think some of the when, when you had like style GAN 2 and when deep fakes were like coming along, it became clear that this was a technology that would have I think uh, a lot of impact, not just kind of in within art, but kind of uh, to uh, yeah, impact into society at large. Yeah, I, I, and you're right to, to say, I guess over the last, let's say, you know, five six years, the, the field has evolved so rapidly that it's actually quite difficult to compare art, say, from the early days of Pix to Pix or, or or Deep Dream, the first style gans to what's possible today with a click at the click of a button, say in mid journey or Dali two or stable diffusion. And so perhaps you could just talk a little bit about how the field has evolved since you first started working in it and perhaps just take us on a brief timeline of what you think those significant advancements have been and how they've shaped the work of artists uh, that you've seen in, in the creative domain. Sure. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, my entry point into the field was with uh, Deep Dream in around uh, 2015. When uh, Yeah, so that was like eight years ago. It feels like uh, quite a long time ago, though, of course, AI and art as ideas have been linked for, I think, a while, depending on how you kind of define AI. But certainly kind of looking at Deep Dream onwards, with, with the Deep Dream aesthetic, which, as I mentioned, was kind of very multicolored and there were these kind of uh, random, uh, I suppose, animals c coming out of a normal image. I mean, that was quite a distinct aesthetic and actually very few artists ever worked with it for some reason. There was an initial kind of outburst of, uh, I think, many researchers kind of dabbling with these tools, maybe to make videos or to post their selfies on Twitter. But out of artists, there's only, I think, Daniel Ambrosi, who still continues working with uh, with this tool. And he's kind of made a customized version and kind of really tries to combine the aesthetics of the technology also with, uh, with the subject matter he looks at, which is normally landscapes. Mm -hmm. And then sort of like after Deep Dream came style transfer, which is when you have a, an image and you can change it into the style of Monet or Van Gogh or another artist. And again, that created a lot of interest within the technology community, because I think if you don't know much about art, whenever you think of it, you would think of all these classical artists like Picasso or Monet or Van Gogh. Mm. But uh, there was a little bit less interest in the artistic community because they felt that uh, all the people were doing is trying to replicate the style of uh, an artist from the past as opposed to trying to do something new, which, which is something that, you know, artists of today are trying to do. Mm. So, uh, yeah, I think that tool never also got kind of much attention from uh, people from the art world. But um, yeah, a lot of researchers, I think, spent a lot of time developing various kind of new style transfer algorithms to to improve it, which was kind of like surreal, the difference in kind of perspective and goals between the two communities. But anyway, then uh, came the GAN, so the Generative Adversarial Networks and um, yeah, I think initially they started off kind of generating images that were perhaps um, 
not of the highest quality or they were making kind of mistakes in terms of placing the facial features or uh, the limbs on the body. Mm. But uh, gradually kind of the, the quality improved and some of the later GAN models became kind of very realistic. And yeah, a lot of artists, I think before text image generators came along, GANs were kind of the main tools artists used. And um, yeah, so there were artists like uh, Myra Klingemann that looked at the human form and they kind of experimented with, I think, every new GAN model that kind of uh, came along. Mm. And there was also a group of artists who worked with their own data sets, including Anna Riddler, who um, who I worked with um, for Impact Festival in the Netherlands. So I commissioned her to do an artwork uh, for, for which she came to the Netherlands, bought lots of tulips, took 10,000 photographs, and this way made her own data set. So she classified and labeled all these like uh, tulip photographs, and then she proceeded to train again to generate tulips. And I think that artwork became very successful um, because, yeah, because Anna really kind of highlighted the link between, I think, uh, the human labor and the AI output and the way she displayed the work included showing the generated um, image and then also kind of part of the data set. So she'd have like a thousand of these little photographs up on the wall. And that really kind of helps you make the link that, you know, AI isn't just kind of this final image. There's also a lot of kind of human labor and past work mm. involved. So, that's, yeah. I, just on that point, I think that's really interesting to point out is I, I guess the change from back in the in the early days of AI art, I guess the data set cu curation itself was part of the art, you know, pulling together um what you wanted in your training set so that you could produce art that were was was the latent space of that that piece of art was interesting and, and something people would want to want to look at to now where there's i guess art being produced that's more off the shelf as a result of text to image um and perhaps if you could just yeah if you could talk through the sort of the the, the modern approach to ai art and how you know is it in some ways easier now and therefore there's a lower bar barrier to entry than say the early days of the artists that you mentioned where they were having to build their own data sets by literally taking images of tulips because there wasn't that data available. Um, is, have you seen a shift in the industry? Um, yes. Yeah, so for me, it's been kind of really interesting, I guess, as I've been in the field for a number of years now and the artists who I mentioned like Mario Klingerman uh, Anna Riddler and then, you know, maybe Sophia Crespo and some others were kind of more emerging a few years back. And now they are kind of, they're, they're kind of very much established artists and because they were some of the pioneers in AI art. And some of those artists have moved on to the latest tools. So Mario Klingerman, for example, he developed a project called Botta where I think there was also like a DAO and he used kind of some of these text image generators to uh, come up with uh, a few images per week. And then the DAO decided kind of which, which of the images would then be put up for auction. And mm. I remember the project, I think he was probably doing it in 2021. So back when uh, NFTs still sold really well, but he made probably like a million within within wow. a few weeks and I was thinking like, wow, that's that's a lot of money. So yeah, some artists like Mario kind of really embrace these new tools. And then I think other artists I've been working with, they haven't necessarily been working as closely with, you know, Stable Diffusion or Dali. They've maybe started to look beyond AI and look at um, other ways of kind of working with technology. So I remember kind of seeing some of the works that Anna Riddler had made for a recent exhibition I curated for Unit London. And um, I think, yeah, she was collaborating together with Sophia Crespo and they made a work that was kind of trying to use, I think, the chlorophyll from plants in um, 
kind of some way to process the artwork and um you know there was kind of not as big an ai involvement there and as in the previous work and i think that experimentation can only be good because yeah. with a lot of these um kind of latest text to image tools in some ways it's uh, a bit tricky to really have your own voice or yeah. um a setting it feels to me in many ways like it becomes like a purely visual medium like photography and yes you can generate like all these images but if you want to make something interesting maybe you need to do a lot of post processing or you need to really think very deeply about the concept or the storytelling around the work yeah i wholeheartedly agree and i think that's a really interesting point that you make around the performative aspect of the art is often you know part of the art itself it's not just a something to 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 look at it's it's how was that art made and in the early days of generative ai art i it, there's a whole story behind how that came to be and i think you're absolutely right to say you know i, I guess artists now are looking at other ways to still cont- still make that storytelling element part of their work when using tools like dali or um or mid journey or stable diffusion and 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 that i guess brings me to my next question which would be what in your opinion makes a great piece of ai art um when you're cur- curating and selecting art for for an exhibition what is it that you look for to effectively engage the public um you know is it is it important that the viewer knows that it's ai art for example is is that part of the allure or is that something you try to sort of have as a big reveal and say oh this was actually ai generated um what would you say yeah so i guess uh yeah normally when i curate it is an ai art exhibition so then i suppose people know that all the artworks kind of in the exhibition will have kind of some ai link to it and mm-hmm. i suppose i don't see all these works as kind of completely ai generated it really depends on the artist and how they use those tools and i suppose yeah with a lot of the kind of digital works frequently it is an ai generated image that maybe becomes part of the work but um there are some artists who use ai just as part of the process and then maybe end up with a painting that was somehow kind of inspired by the ai generated image or they use kind of this generated image and like tweak it physically with with a paintbrush in in, in some mm-hmm. way to kind of give give meaning to it and then of course there are also artists who um yeah who sort of like work with slightly different tools like facial recognition or they kind of create an image that they want to be recognized by these uh, image recognition systems and yeah maybe that image isn't ai generated so mm. yeah sometimes there is kind of a lot of breadth but um yeah to answer your kind of uh, main question i mean i try to yeah get an understanding of um um yeah of the artwork on many levels so what technologies is the artist using kind of how well are they using those uh, technologies and and then um what is the concept of the art uh, of the artwork what is kind of the artist trying to say are they trying to comment on something and yeah then i guess i look at the final presentation and um and aesthetics and kind of make a judgment but i certainly mm. remember kind of in the early days of uh, ai art sometimes it was very tricky to actually find artworks that were both uh, interesting technically and had a concept because like people from the technical community they mainly focused on trying to come up with a new model or execute a really new process and would maybe fail to come up with a concept which is something mm. that art world really loves whereas artists who were coming from the art world and were working with these tools they were maybe working with some of the most basic tools and uh some of their work would really kind of would really look quite backwards uh, as the, uh in in terms of the technology but of course conceptually it was more developed so art critics probably liked it more 
Yeah, that's that's fascinated me. I, I think as well that this collision between two fields that m- many I think would sort of say have often been in almost adversarial to each other art and technology you know you don't sort of think of those two things as going hand in hand and yet when you think and stop and think about it for a moment you realize all of art is driven by the technological improvements of the age whether that's a different pigment you know in in the early days of art or a different way of making paint stick to canvas or um photography like you mentioned earlier the very fact that i guess in the at the early days of um uh, photography people were already saying this is the death of art and look today you know the art is as, as thriving as ever and it has formed its own carved its out it its out its own uh, region of the of the art world um and I, I just wonder if we will look back and see ai art as similar to photography in that it forms its own niche and people will respect it for being ai art or whether we're seeing a more fundamental shift in how all artists will um, will create and, and whether there will come a point where it's almost impossible not to use AI in some regard in order to create art. I mean, that's a, a big question there, but do you think, what do you sort of see as, as the future being in terms of how AI is used by artists? Do you, do you sort of see it as its own field that will stay its own field? Um... Yes, well, the future is always difficult to predict. And certainly when I kind of, um, yeah, began working in the field, I was trying to figure out where kind of AI art fitted in. And because it was so emerging at that point, it felt like each community had its own definition. So the AI researchers, the contemporary art world, the media artists and I don't know, computer artists, everybody kind of had a very different uh, artistic output and aesthetic and and so on. But now, of course, when the field has kind of gone uh, so much more mainstream, where there are so many more tools available of a much higher quality, um, yes, it's, uh, yeah, th- things have perhaps changed. Um, so maybe I think that uh, in many ways, Artists who kind of think more deeply and critically about AI and who perhaps incorporate it into their process and then come up with something that's like a physical artwork or, I don't know, an installation or a sculpture. I mean, they are probably trying to operate just like artists and the rest of the contemporary art field. So they are kind of using Mm -hmm. the tools that are most appropriate to them and kind of making work around that. And then, of course, you have uh, all these kind of artists who maybe generate a purely digital image or a video. And in some ways there, it does seem to become its almost kind of its own genre because there are a lot of uh, commonalities in the tools they use and uh, a lot of kind of parallels in the language or the concepts that they might look at. And um, yeah, so I see in, in the future artists as being able to use AI as kind of one of the tools in, uh, mm-hmm. in the toolbox, depending on uh, the type of work they're trying to create. And yeah, I mean, now it is a very kind of popular, popular tool, but there are, I think, various concerns regarding kind of... Uh, copyright and and so on so um let's see how they also develop yeah i i definitely want to come on to that with you in a moment i think the copyright issues is definitely worth um worth talking about at, at length i just want to uh, linger just on one point that you mentioned there which is about the physicality of of art and you know the the raw sort of paint on canvas feel of a of, of an original there's something i guess there that cannot yet be sort of taken away from an artist and that there is in the digital space a real um i i, I guess a, a paradigm shift in in how digital art is being produced with generative tools but the raw physicality or performance aspect of a piece of art you know over time is something that you know there are no real ai tools out there that can that can do that 
um, unless we're talking about robotics and I guess robot generated art. Um, so do you think that, yes, artists will be therefore looking towards the more physical real world aspects of their art and saying, this is what makes me unique rather than say the composition of a piece of art where it's I, uh, something, I guess, that could be enhanced or at least, uh, generated in part by AI and, and iterations of this, you know, produced by, by an AI tool. And the, the, what matters more is the, yeah, the physicality and the, the actual real world, you know, here I am looking at this piece of art and I can see the you know, blood, sweat and tears that's gone into it from the artist. Um, do you think there's going to be a more, perhaps a shift towards that kind of art? Hmm. Well, I think it depends on the type of artist and what they're trying to achieve because yeah, art is something that appeals to so many different people. So you have some artists who are professional artists. So, you know, they go to art school, they exhibit and sell their work. They mm. try and feature in museums and various biennales. And then you also have kind of artists who, for whom maybe art is a hobby. So they have a very different day job, but they occasionally like to kind of paint to maybe release the kind of frustrations or um, just, yeah, I don't know, do, do something kind of different uh, with their mm. time. So I think the artists who kind of maybe have art as a hobby, um, I think working with paints and maybe sitting outside and painting a landscape is kind of very different from, you know, just generating something in mid-journey. So I think... Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah, those guys wouldn't necessarily shift to all these digital tools. And um, yeah, all those who work in the contemporary art world and who live off sales and various grants, they would probably have to see what institutions are funding and what collectors are preferring. So I remember kind of back in the day when I was speaking to an artist called Roman Lipsky, who's kind of based in Berlin, and he has been painting lands landscapes for, uh, I don't know, like decades. And at one point, he was working with an AI to kind of try and mix up his style, and he moved away from realism to abstraction. And I remember just speaking with him, and he was saying that not all of his collectors appreciated that he started incorporating AI into his work. So it also probably depends on what feedback kind of artists get from the market. And I don't mm -hmm. know, certainly from my perspective, sometimes it feels to me like a painted image is kind of much more special. So it's probably nicer to own. But then again, with the recent kind of boom of the NFTs where people were paying a lot of money for digital images, it's also possible that for some internet kind of natives, maybe the younger generation, it's kind of the digital image that's much more important. Yeah, maybe it's a generational thing. You're right. Maybe, you know, I maybe I'm getting old here and I'm sort of thinking I, I, I like seeing the, you know, when I look at certainly old paintings, I, I often go really close to the canvas because I love the feeling of seeing, you know, how that artist has created it. And you sort of imagine them putting that brushstroke down and, and, you know, why there and not, not somewhere else. And I suppose some in some regard, if you're looking at a pure digital image, you, you know, you, you don't really see that. But then you might uh, you might argue, well, actually, there's a lot of work that's gone into creating the data set or generating the, the prompt that's helped put that composition together. Um, I also wanted to ask you about personalization, especially, you know, hi hyper personalization, really, where everybody is their own artist. And this idea that actually, because we now have tools available that give, you know, the everyday person the ability to create quite stunning and beautiful images, albeit digitally, whether you think there will be a shift, not just in AI art, but also AI, AI music, um, AI novels towards the idea that you can at any point of the day just decide what you want to look at, decide what you want to read, decide what you want to hear, and it's just there generated for you. Um, so first of all, whether you think that's a, a, reali a, a reality that we'll soon be living in, but also, you know, is that something that, that excites you or is that something that you think detracts from the the, the, what makes art special, which is it's it's a, it's an indiv often an individual's journey to create something that's unique to them. 
Um, where, whereabouts on that spectrum would you say you fall? Yeah, so I guess this trend of hyper personalization is not something I feel particularly excited about. It kind of uh, makes me think of uh, recommendation engines, kind mm -hmm. of. Um, yeah, really kind of pr providing you with more of the same. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it just makes me feel a little bit sad. So I think I always enjoy yeah, trying to, I don't know if I'm in a certain mood and I want a certain book or film or so on, trying to find something. And maybe a lot of the time I won't find exactly what I'm looking for, but I will find something that will maybe inspire me to look at another field or that will kind of challenge me in ways I didn't expect. And I think that's kind of what we want from art. I think there mm -hmm. is plenty of content on social media, let's say like, I don't know, on TikTok or Instagram. So you, if you wanna see more cat videos, it's like very easy mm -hmm. to keep kind of looking at them there. And yeah, we probably don't need kind of more of that. We need kind of more ways, I think, for humans to discover maybe underappreciated authors, artists, mm -hmm. and, and, and so on. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, and I think you're right that there's a risk in trying to hyper-personalize, we end up just homogenizing. And that, you know, what looks like hyper-personalization is actually just, as you rightly say, almost like a, a Netflix recommendation engine, where it's trying to be so personal to you that you never experience that, that sense of novelty that actually sends the shiver down your spine because it's something you didn't expect. And I think surprise is often an, an overlooked element in art, but also in just other mediums that we don't always want to see what we know we like. Um, so I think you've, you've hit the nail on the head there with that, that point. Um, just the last point before we, we move a topic. Um, I also wanted to talk about uh, it, whether you've seen any backlash to AI art from artists or elsewhere that are saying, look, this isn't art, this is just technology gone mad and technology let off the leash and you know it's it's suck, sucking the soul out of art. Have you seen any backlash to, to it? Well, yeah, I think a lot of the art critics were never particularly enthusiastic about AI art, particularly in the earlier years. I remember I sent some works by some of the top AI artists to one of the top kind of US art critics and he was just completely making fun of it all. Really? Mm. Um, yeah, so, but yeah, I think the contemporary art world is a bit of a tricky field in many respects because they value a lot kind of the brand of the artist. So ideally they'd come from the right art school and I mean, most importantly, they are able to kind of come up with a crazy story and, and a way to sell their work. Mm. And I think looking at a lot of these kind of works by made by AI artists, if you didn't really understand how AI technology worked at the time and the state of the art, it would be probably quite difficult to judge its merit, particularly because at that point there wasn't kind of uh, so much thought gone into developing kind of the concept or the story around the image. So yeah, in general, it felt to me that kind of before the text to image generators came along, there was a lot of uh, kind of negativity of maybe lack of excitement from uh, the art critics. Though, of course, a lot of the museums continued putting on AI art shows, partly because AI was just becoming such a big topic and it was interesting for them to also address the ethical and the societal concerns. But I think mm -hmm. since the text to image generators um, came along, certainly there are kind of more and more people are impressed by what can be generated uh, using uh, those tools. So, yeah. yeah, in some ways, maybe there's a little bit kind of less backlash in terms of the aesthetics of the generated image because the quality is so much higher and it's mm -hmm. so much more appealing. But probably there is a lot more concern regarding 
what that does to kind of all the illustrators and all the artists who've been uploading their artwork up on deviant art and so on yeah maybe it's like any new technology it goes on that hype cycle doesn't it of uh people at first say well it's not good enough it's never going to be good enough and i guess the early ai work was the same where people were saying look it's never going to be of the quality of a true artist and then you see actually you know it's actually it's getting quite good now and then people start to take notice but maybe they don't they don't see it as being you know mainstream and now we're in the position where there's tools that you know anyone in the world can use very simply to produce not ai art but certainly ai images and in some regards like you say there are artists out there doing incredible things with these tools and now it's being taken very very seriously so um yeah it's probably just like any technology isn't it that it it goes through that that cycle of um adoption um you have the early adopters that see the value in it and see the see the future and then everyone takes a little while to catch up um so i i just wanted to also uh touch on a topic that's personal to me as well i, I used to be a teacher and i i was was interested in the application of technology in the classroom because on the one hand i see the benefit of putting the most powerful tools in the hands of those who have the potential to do the most with them and uh, children are you know, infinitely curious and um, you know really do use these technologies to the best of their advantage but also the the old-fashioned man in me likes the idea that you know there is some hard graph that goes into learning and you shouldn't just expect everything instantly um, so I guess my question is around art education and particularly for children so where you know, I'm talking from maybe the age of 13 upwards where you know, children are computer savvy. They will understand that there is things such as text to image. But in the art classroom, they're being told to produce things, you know, without any sort of guidance on composition, perhaps through AI art. Um, do you think in the future we'll start to see more education on AI art in the classroom. I presume at the moment it's not really part of the curriculum um, in, a, in a major way, but maybe that will change. Um, do you think that's the case and, and do you think that's a good thing? Yeah, education. I think it's always challenging and it, it can be like quite different. So I think the most I did in art was uh, GCSE art, which was like a long time ago now. And there I can't remember ever having to do anything with computers. It was very much, you know, all the traditional tools that you use. Yeah. And, um, yeah, nowadays I think artists who kind of go through degree programs, they would probably be a lot of variation depending on the type of school they go to because some schools would have quite traditional programs others would kind of have a mix and some would be very digital. So I think there'd mm -hmm. be a lot of kind of variation there. And in terms of kind of teenagers and the type of their education they would receive. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I still don't think they, they would kind of begin working with these tools in art classes, partly because it's an optional kind of mm. course. But I think if there's anything kind of related to computers or programming, then art would actually be a great way to engage those students who are not so interested in, uh, you know, kind of learning to code or learning the math mm. to kind of present them those technologies kind of through art, through kind of making art or through making music. So, yeah, I do think it's kind of a great way to engage engage teenagers into the kind of the coding mm. world across the spectrum yeah and, and i suppose it's the idea that um it, it's just one tool in the toolbox of an artist and it doesn't have to be the you know ai art in itself doesn't have to be the thing that you're trying to achieve like i am producing a piece of ai art here it might just be one tool that you use presumably to perhaps decide on the composition for some items that you want to collect together um, and so whilst it's formed part of your process as an artist, the, the ultimately the, the thing that you're producing isn't AI art, it's your own hard work that's gone into, um, you know, whether that's painting, sculpture, um, performance art, you know, that's that's you. But, and, uh, you know, I wonder if it's the same thing with that we're seeing in large language modelling, where 
you know, GPT-4 isn't necessarily the thing that's going to produce your essay, but it might help you to understand and collect your ideas. So, yeah, I wonder if, does that sort of, do you agree with that sort of sentiment that it's going to form sort of part of the arsenal of artists in the future, um, especially, and I'm thinking in, in the classroom where, you know, kids are very tech savvy and they, they are probably going to go home and start using tools like Midjourney to decide how to uh, produce, you know, this this piece of art for their A-level. Um, so it will just form part of their 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 toolbox yeah i certainly see it yeah certainly something they can add to the toolbox uh though i don't know perhaps sometimes this may it may not always be kind of the most uh, efficient way because if they've been tasked to i don't know make a kind of a physical oil painting of a particular scene um then i don't know sometimes kind of working with these digital tools won't necessarily kind of shorten the amount of effort but in uh, in many other ways when uh, maybe they're trying to figure out what is the right kind of color palette to use or what is kind mm. of the right i don't know aesthetic or general style to use then kind of working with a lot of these tools can help them come up with a number of different variations very quickly and they can then figure out how to direct their work. So, so yeah, certainly, mm. as you say, it is another tool that will have a lot of users, but it's not like a, like a hammer that you should kind of hit exactly. every nail with. Precisely, yeah, I, I agree. And I, I suppose it comes down to this point as well of, you know, much of what we consider to be the greatest pieces of art is it, it feels like an extrapolation from what come what came before rather than simply interpolating the latent space of all things that have come before and finding, you know, something that's slightly different from a piece of art that, that came before and, and, and more towards another genre. It feels like, you know, a lot of art comes from the human condition of being able to, 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 to extrapolate from what is already known. And, um, uh, you know, I wonder if, if we become too reliant sometimes on, on some of these off the shelf tools, if we'll end up, like we talked about just now, becoming a sort of homogenized uh, it will become too homogenized and we won't see that, that those giant leaps of faith that sometimes we do see in the art world and elsewhere in, in all creative arts. Yeah. Sorry, that wasn't really a question there. Um, <laughs> I, I, I would, uh, yeah, I suppose my, my question would be just around, um, you know, interpolation versus extrapolation and whether um, do you think that, you know, do, do you think that, that some of sometimes the most impressive pieces of art are, those that you, you can't really compare to anything that's come before. Um, and, and I'm sort of thinking of, you know, people always say, well, I could have done that, but you know, you didn't. And it's, it's that sort of, it's that feeling of, yes, okay. You know, this is something that could be done by anybody, but this person has thought to do it and has, and has built a whole um, genre around that, that, that concept. Um, do you see that in the AI art world as well, where you just see, you've had experiences where you've seen artists that you think, wow, like, how have you ever come up with that? And that's an, that's an incredible um, concept that you've put together. Yeah, definitely. Sometimes, I, I think actually that's one of the most kind of exciting things about being in the field and having kind of a sort of visibility because you have people who send you all the art projects. And I mean, a lot of them might be kind of what you expect. But sometimes, yeah, you get these projects and it's like, wow, I would have never kind of thought about using this kind of particular tool in, in this way. So it's definitely, I think, something um, quite exciting. Yeah. And so then my, my, my next question is going to be around copyright, because I guess this is a, a real issue that's starting to rear its head, not just for AI art, but also uh, particularly within large language modeling and the data that's been used to train these models. Um, what would you say your general stance is on this? Because I, I guess there's, it, it comes to it from two points, which is you know, copywriting of actual AI, uh, actual art that's gone into training these models and whether that's, um, that feels to you ethical. And then secondly, should, there be, should people using these tools feel any sort of um, responsibility towards the the artists that created that you know the art that's trained that data or do you think it's all really the responsibility of the the model trainers so the stability ais of this world or the open ais um 
where do you think the responsibility sort of lies? Yes, um, it's a tricky question with the, with the responsibility. So certainly I like that there are, there's an artist project by I think Matt Dryhurst and another artist called Spawning AI or Have I Been Trained? which oh, yeah. kind of, I think, allowed artists to check if the artwork was part of a data set and they wanted to kind of make tools that would allow them to opt out. And uh, yeah, so I think that was kind of a, a really good tool and a great example of kind of artists showing some activism and trying to kind of figure out how they could could, could solve that problem. And um yeah, I suppose, yeah, in general, it is tricky to figure out how to make uh, everything kind of work for everyone, but also kind of not stifle innovation. Mm. And um, kind of from working a little bit with the NFT world, I really liked that uh, sometimes kind of when you, so, so when you sell an NFT, you have this kind of smart contract and when if you if, if the person who bought it sells it again, the original artist still gets royalties. So it's kind of all encoded in this mm. like smart contract. So I sort of wish that somebody would eventually develop a, a mechanism that um, yeah, if if let's say I as a user was kind of I don't know working with generating some images that were based on certain artists, and then I would use it commercially then uh, kind of the system would figure out who, which artist works are used and would mm. kind of maybe give them a little bit of money. Yeah, that's interesting. So it might end up being a technological solution to a technological problem. Because um, you're right that we've never really had the situation where um, you can't really find the derivative works directly because the derivative works are millions of images and probably every single one of those images is credited in some way in that piece of art, but on a minuscule amount. And I, yeah, I suppose you're right that there might need to be a technological solution, therefore, that, that has some sort of uh, blockchain based attribution or like you say, smart contract tr contract based attribution to all of the works that have gone into it. Um, I, I, I like that idea as well. I think that it's possible. It just needs I don't know who the body would be that would have to enforce it because <laughs> I don't think that body exists at the moment. Um, so yeah, really interesting that uh, you, you, you see that as well. Um, what would you say to artists who, I guess, are a bit intimidated by the technology? Um, do, do you think that, you know, do, do you think, okay, intimidated in two ways, perhaps intimidated, first of all, that their art is going to be um, sort of commoditized or that their art is going to be used to train large language, uh, large image models that, uh, and it ends up being swallowed up into this giant sort of model that they don't really understand where their art is going to be, is going to be sold in future. Um, would you say to them, what, what would you say to them? Would you, would you be sort of optimistic that, that the future is, is bright and that there are people obviously that care about this stuff uh, and that ultimately want the best outcome for all, um, you know, they're not just kind of doing this for a technological um, buzz, if you like, but they're, they're trying to further the, the further art as a, as a concept. And therefore that, that involves all artists. Yeah, no, I, I think I can understand if artists would be intimidated or worried by the technology. I mean, I've seen artists kind of do that kind of even before the text to image models came along, even with the uh, kind of with the early GAN models, artists were mm. still kind of um, worried a little bit. But now, of course, it's a lot more real. And I think if you have a career as an illustrator and you work a lot with kind of clients on a tight budget, then probably you will struggle soon because all those like bloggers or those who don't want to pay for art, they will just kind of generate images. And um, yeah, I don't know how I see the future. It feels like uh, everything is happen is happening very fast, and uh, I'm not kind of seeing too much kind of regulation or governance kind of stepping in just yet. Because I think those organizations normally operate on much slower timescales, and 
they also probably need a lot of time to even understand what the technology is doing and everything. So yeah, it'll be interesting to see how it develops. But I do think artists are kind of a key profession in uh, in this world. And um, yeah, I think they should kind of continue um, making work. Uh, though, yeah, there's sometimes I feel a little bit also kind of sorry for artists who yeah who have been uploading their work onto deviant art for decades and i think like if you want to generate a particular kind of style with i don't know stable diffusion or mid journey and you type in i think the name greg mm -hmm. rudkowski or something then you have like really good results and i'm yeah. sort of worried about this guy in some respects because probably i don't know how many people would what would actually commission him to do work nowadays because his aesthetic is kind of so pervasive and so popular and so easily kind of achieved through those tools so mm. probably artists just need to kind of keep an eye out on the latest developments and really kind of evaluate the pros and cons as to whether they can be kind of opted out of a data set mm. or whether it's something they would want to do or not and maybe try and yeah figure out also how they can make work that isn't that is just beyond the, 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 that is also beyond the physical the the digital image and that maybe has some sort of physical component or something else kind of unique about it that is kind of very difficult to be swallowed up and replicated by these text -to image mm. systems yeah exactly and i think um yeah, it reminds me a little bit of the the music world at the moment, where you know Drake and I think Grimes have been sort of involved in this recently with different sort of stances on AI generated music. With you know Drake really not liking the the idea that his voice could be replicated and and therefore used to produce music, and the Grimes taking the opposite opinion and being like, "Yeah, I'm happy for this. I think there's an opportunity here, and I can see a business model where this works." And I I think. You mentioned there that um, Greg Rogowski, and I think the same thing is it's almost like a direct parallel in that you know he he wouldn't have been perhaps as well known given his the fact that he's now being used as a as a as a prompt to produce beautiful images and maybe in some ways that furthers his career. I mean I I don't know, but I suppose there's always two sides, isn't there, to every argument, and um, it might be that we see artists take different stances, like you say, uh, that, that some will be very very happy for their because it's almost like a validation of their work if if people are using that as a something that they want their art their art to look like then they might be all for it but also i can see the other point of view um so i think you make you make very valid points there on in, in both arguments um again just looking briefly to the future are, are there any things you know coming up that you've got or, or exciting trends that you're seeing um that you think yeah, this is this could be this could be really interesting for the AI art world. Um, are there any projects that you know about at the moment that particularly inspire you? Um, yeah, so in, in terms of AI art projects, it always feels to me that um, the art world normally follows the technological developments. Mm -hmm. So when all these like text -to image generators came along, that's what kind of the artists began doing and recently of course there's been more and more leaps in the large language models so probably there will be kind of even more experimentation with uh, you know the even better generated text and uh, yeah also with all these kind of multimodal tools yeah. I expect there to be kind of more artwork um, yeah, being, being made with them. But um, yeah, I can't say that I've seen any any particular artwork that I would probably highlight as, uh, as one of those. Sometimes it takes time for artists to kind of experiment with all these tools and kind of make mm. something that they really kind of want, um, yeah. want to say with the technology. And in terms of... Um, yeah, in terms of my projects, I'm kind of currently working on uh, the next edition of the Leicester Art and AI Festival, where we normally bring a lot of these cutting edge AI artists to exhibit in, uh, in Leicester. 
in uh, various kind of public venues like the shopping center, the hospital, the library, and and so on. And yeah, I quite like kind of doing that project because Leicester is the city where I grew up, and uh, also kind of putting a lot of this. AI generated art in um, in a very kind of public setting where it's not just for you know uh, art aficionados who would go into a white cube gallery or into a museum to see art it's just for everyone who's just you know going about mm. town and they have a chance to um, have access to this art and kind of maybe yeah have a say in, in what it means yeah what do you think, what would you say is the current public perception of what's possible with AI and, and art? Do you, I mean, speaking to people I know, I mean, I think I'm in a bit of a bubble really with the kind of people I speak to, because a lot of the people I speak to are AI people. So, they, you know, obviously they've heard of things like you know, Mid Journey, Dali 2, etc. But I'm always surprised to see how many people haven't seen the output of one of these models and are just stunned when you tell them this isn't a picture of a person this is this person doesn't exist uh and you know they're standing there in maybe beautiful sort of period dress or something you know something that you would sort of think well yes obviously that's a real person um from speaking to people and you obviously a lot of your work is is in the public eye do you, are you surprised at how the public react to ai art or are you are you pleasantly surprised or you, what's their kind of general impression would you say of the average person on the street <laughs> Oof. Yeah, so sometimes I also feel that I spend a lot of my time speaking to audiences either, let's say, from the arts or from technology who might have a, um, yeah, who might have a more advanced understanding. But certainly when uh, we were doing some of the early iterations of the Leicester Art and AI Festival, we were working with uh, with a couple of projects that were chatbots and uh, I remember some of the kind of generated sentences or tweets that they made were kind of not quite as expected and uh, certainly maybe the average person on the street would think that okay AI isn't mm -hmm. actually that great and yeah because with technology it feels like even if the original system is quite advanced frequently if you try and kind of execute it there will be some silly error like i don't know the connection with the screen or i don't know the fact that if it's an interactive installation you need to stand in this very particular place and if you don't things won't work mm. so it feels like there are a lot of kind of uh restrictions that sometimes maybe the audiences are not always kind of prepared for because you know AI is shown in the media as being kind of super powerful and then when you kind of come into contact with it you can see that there are still a lot of uh, mistakes and technical failures mm -hmm. that are kind of made. Yeah I've definitely had that experience as well where it's got to it's that uncanny valley isn't it where if it's not perfect if it's almost perfect but not quite perfect then people are very very distrustful or they just sort of see it as ah oh, yeah i've caught it out you know I, i'm cleverer than i can see where where this has gone wrong and i think we're sort of at the point now where that's becoming harder and harder to detect and um you know especially just going back to art itself i think it's sometimes those imperfections do just add to the art and that's something i guess humans are very good at is putting imperfections into things um, because we're not perfect ourselves so I suppose um, in some regards, you know, these imperfections are form, form part of the art and maybe as these tools get better and better, we, you know, we don't want to produce something that's a photorealistic image, but um, they will be used more for, yeah, producing art that is in some way um, more akin to, you know, previous movements where they didn't try to replicate things perfectly, but just provide an abstract concept of, of things. Um, yeah. So look, my last question really has been fascinating talking to you. And I think we've covered, we've covered so much um, in this, in this episode around you know, AI art itself, but also the, the legal aspects of it with copyright and, and what it means in the classroom. Uh, the last question really to you would be, could you share any advice to listeners uh, who've heard this today and thought, yeah, this is, I, I really want to get into this. I think this is going to be a, a really interesting area for me in the future. Um, both in terms of resources, so anywhere that they can go to kind of find out more about your work or about the, um, the work of other AI artists, and also from a technological perspective, 
um, you know, where would you recommend people start? Where can they start dabbling in AI art? Um, are there people they should follow perhaps on, on Twitter or are there exhibitions that you know of that would be fantastic for, to get to? Sure. Well, to kind of learn more about my work, um, you can go on my website, eluba.com. So that's e -L -L -U -B -A com. And um, yeah, as part of my work and the kind of Europe's creativity workshop you mentioned, I made a website called aiartonline.com, which has kind of a showcase of early AI art from 2017 to 2020. So kind of exactly the time before the text to image generators. And it can sort of kind of uh, help you maybe understand what are some of the other tools that are maybe not the most obvious now, but could still kind of provide you with uh, inspiration and ideas depending on what you're trying to do. And uh, in terms of uh, kind of, yeah, technological resources, um, yeah, so I need to kind of <laughs> think about who who has done like the most up to date overview with uh, with the latest tools because things have changed a lot. But I know in the past, Gene Kogan used to run a course on machine learning for artists, and uh, yeah, I at some point I think just during the pandemic, I made uh, a list of creative AI resources for the Serpentine Galleries. And I think that's probably accessible on uh, creative-ai.org website, maybe. They have this like creative AI lab that, where they also have these resources and, and they try to incorporate interviews. And um, yeah, for people to follow, if you want to look at some of the key artists in the field, I think it would be people like Mario Klingerman, Anna Riddler, Sophia Crespo, Memo Acton, uh, also maybe Refik Anadol. And um, yeah, I think they're kind of useful to look at in terms of the work they create, the approaches uh, they take. And uh, yeah. Brilliant. Well, Luba, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you about something that you obviously know a huge amount about. And I'm sure our listeners have learned uh, a ton listening to you today. So thank you for coming on the AI Canvas podcast and best of luck with your future work in the field. Thank you so much for the invitation, David. It was uh, really great to chat with you. And I think you've asked some really kind of, uh, yeah, exciting questions. So I hope the listeners enjoy it. Awesome. Well, thanks very much and uh, best of luck for the future.